Thanks. Uh, my name, first of all, uh, audio check. Am I audible? Coming through okay? Not too hot, not too cold. If I yell, it's not going to peg your meters? A little bit. All right. Former audio engineer trying to help the guy in the back of the room because he's got the toughest job here. My name's Howard Taylor. I write and illustrate Schlock Mercenary, which is epic science fiction, four panels at a time in the format of uh, what we used to call a newspaper comic strip. How many of you have picked up an actual newspaper sometime in the last five years? <laughs> what is wrong with you children? <laughs> I haven't picked up a newspaper in that long. <laughs> oh, the Daily Universe. They don't have an iPad edition? Yeah, okay. Um, that format is structured for... The, the newspaper comic format is structured for beat, 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 punchline. Um, it is a formula that is every bit as, uh, as tried and tired out and trope-tastic as uh, three-chord electric guitar rock music, as the walking backbeat snare drum. Um, it is very, very formulaic. And uh, and it's easy for me. I can sit down and I can start writing, write all the way to the fourth panel and realize, ah, I don't have a joke yet. And I'll stare at it for a moment and all I need to do is scoot some things around and the joke will manifest itself. This, by the way, is not a gift. It's not genetic. It has nothing to do with the fact that I was born on the 29th of February. Um, it has everything to do with the fact that at some point I decided that a good reward for me for interacting with other people would be if they laughed. And, th and see, I, you just failed to reward me for saying that. <laughs> but you laughed at that. Why? And that's the first question I have for you. We're going to talk about humor. Um, why? Did you laugh at that? There's an episode of Writing Excuses in which, oh yeah, I do Writing Excuses with Brandon, um, and uh, it's lots of fun, and I learned way more doing it than you guys will learn listening to what I say on it, but that's just the nature of the beast. Um, there was an episode of Writing Excuses in which uh, we introduced Jim Hines, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, Jim Hines. All the men want to be like him, and all the women want to be with those men. <laughs> and we all laughed, and Brandon said, w -w -w wait, 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 why is that funny? And I got to explain during that episode the principle of the comic drop, which I'm going to come back around to, but the important question to be asking yourself is, why did I laugh? Why did you laugh at that? Why do you laugh at things in general? Um, was it Mel Brooks who said uh, comedy is a guy, you know, walking and falling into a manhole and dying, and tragedy is I've got a hangnail? Um, yeah, I, that's not necessarily comedy, which a lot of people don't laugh at Mel Brooks's stuff. Um, <laughs> but if you laugh at a thing, if you laugh at slapstick, for instance, you know, somebody getting hit in the face with a pie, you need to ask yourself why you laughed. Some formulas. I'm going to just write some things on the board here and uh, we'll come back to them in turn. The first I've already mentioned and that is the comic drop. The second is a principle that I asked about when I first came into the room. Yeah, that's a G. Surprising yet inevitable. Um, and the third, I can never remember the, uh, the mnemonic, but it's like uh, clever, cute, bizarre, recognizable, There's another C in there somewhere. Ah, cruel. 
Um, I think I'm still missing one. Uh, and the last is, that's an N, interrupted defense mechanism. By the way, these are written up here, not necessarily so that you can copy down the absolutely unintelligible things that I've written, but so that I now have an outline for what we're going to talk about for the next hour. Um, the comic drop is a lessening in status of somebody in the relationship, whether that relationship is in a comic strip or on screen or in your you know, class clowny sort of personal life. And the reason that people laughed at my comment about Jim Hines is that I was boosting Jim's status. All the men want to be like him. All the women want to be with those men. And Jim dropped in status. Now the comic drop fulfills this piece of Scott Adams formula, uh, at least in that instance, because it's cruel. Uh, and a lot of class clowns, uh, we stop laughing at them because we realize they're relying heavily on the comic drop of other people in order to prop up their own reputation. Um, theme that comes up a lot, oh, it's just a humor comic. Oh, it, you know, it's just a jokey thing. Humor is a tool by which I reach out and alter your metabolism. Think about that for a moment. When you laugh, you, you can stop yourself from laughing. You can clench your fists and clench your teeth and whatever, but if it's really funny and you laugh in an involuntary manner, the person who has executed humor on you has altered your metabolism. That's scary. It's also really difficult to do, especially if you want to try and do it consistently. And once your metabolism has been altered in that way, it lowers your defenses so we can say all sorts of subversive things and we can say things in humorous ways that we absolutely couldn't get away with otherwise. Um, so for me, humor is very, very serious business. It's a tool, and like any tool, it can be abused. But I don't want to focus on that. I want to talk some more about the comic drop. Uh, when I joked about the fact that my outline is now on the board, this isn't for you, this is me. How did the status change? My status dropped. Did I do that on purpose? Absolutely I did that on purpose. Self-deprecatory humor is effective, especially in situations where we have a power relationship that's really kind of backwards. There is one small, chunky version of me up here in the front of the room, and I'm in charge of all of y'all. Weird. And so if I adjust that power relationship, you laugh, and it makes you a little bit more comfortable. Isn't that crazy? This, this is not a psych class, though. Now, <laughs> surprising yet inevitable. How many of you are Firefly fans? Those of you who have not raised your hands just need to leave my sight. <laughs> OK, Firefly opens with the character of Wash, who is, uh, he is the one that we love to laugh at, we love to laugh with when a joke is being told in Firefly, when Joss Whedon needs to reach out and twink us with humor, he goes to Wash, which is why in Serenity, okay, spoiler alert, killing Wash was the way that he could guarantee that we were terrified for everybody else. Because if the comic relief dies, anybody could die, even Jane. Um, <laughs> And you remember his line. Very good. Wash opens by saying, and he's got the little dinosaurs fighting, the, and the uh, Triceratops is saying to the Tyrannosaur, ah, curse you and your surprising yet inevitable betrayal. <laughs> it's hilarious for people who understand the, the process of plotting because this structure, if you can pull it off, it works in humor, it works in horror, it works in detective fiction, it works in all sorts, well, I mean, it works in 
Brandon's epic fantasies. What you try and do is set up a situation where it is surprising the reader did not see that coming. And yet after it has happened, the reader realizes that's the only thing that could have happened. Now, it's easy to set up a story in which the inevitable happens and no one's surprised by it. It's also easy to set up a story in which something is incredibly surprising, but nothing that happened before it telegraphed what was coming. But getting those both to work, it's like magic. And humor uses it too. Come back to the surprising yet inevitable, uh, or excuse me, come back to the comic drop. When I was setting up Jim Hines, the, the drop was surprising. And yet, it was only the addition of one word. One word, two words. I want to be with him versus those men. Okay, I changed, dropped the him, to, so a two word change, okay? Um, and those two words happen all the way at the end. And so you've been led along this path. And when you get to the end of the path, it feels inevitable. Oh, of course, Howard was not going to tout Jim Hines you know, robust sexual appeal, his raw animal magnetism on a podcast. No, when the humorist starts talking like that, a bad thing is coming. <laughs> and he let us get all the way to the end before he, he surprised us, surprised us, and, uh, and lowered Jim's status. So we come back to why you laugh at things. Were things funny because they surprised you? Were they funny because after they surprised you, you look back and you realize, oh, well, that's obviously that's what had to happen. Um, the formula below it is not really a formula per se, as it is a troubleshooting tool. When I talk about my comic process, my, my writing process, I write, I, I can, I can, I can draw what I write. <laughs> I start with a Word document that has four text boxes drawn in it that have borders that are already defined to be the perfect size for comic panels. And so I am looking at the eventual format of what I am trying to create. And then I create other text boxes that will have words in them and as I'm doing this, I imagine, and this is the part that, this is the part, if you're watching me write, feels like, well, wait, what? I have no idea what's happening on this page. And that's because while I'm writing this, I am imagining people saying these things. And maybe those people are holding props. Maybe those people are standing in some peculiar way. There's information that isn't included here. But I will write, and when I get to this last panel, I evaluate it and I ask myself, did, did anything funny happen here? Sometimes what's funny, I'll look at it and say, yep, it's funny because it's comic drop. And then, and this is probably the whole reason Brandon has me come in and uh, talk, talk about this class, or talk about this to this class. Um, I, I can't think of a quick phrase for it. I need to not knock you out of the story. Um, have you ever guys, have, have you ever guys, have you guys ever watched a sitcom that's just all about situational comedy? And there is a joke and you realize the moment the joke is told that if the writers really meant that, all of the characters' relationships would have to change. And the joke just knocks you right out of the story. It's like, okay, that was funny, but that can't happen. Um, I will look at the dialogue and evaluate what's happening in this panel. If it's comic drop, if it's uh, an interrupted defense mechanism, which I haven't talked about yet, whatever's going on, if it's funny but it breaks the story, then I can't use it. I throw away far more jokes than I use for that exact reason. And so I usually erase these words and ask myself if this beat, if this setup, was actually funnier than what happened in the last panel, or if this setup could do something else. Has Brandon talked to you about endings at all? 
a little bit. Tool that uh, we've talked about on writing excuses for endings tool process. Write a good ending and then throw it away and write a better ending and then throw it away and write a better, better ending. And by the time you've gotten to your fourth ending, you probably have something that genuinely fulfills surprising yet inevitable because you've really started to think about it. And so I will look at this setup and I start asking myself what other jokes can be told here. And I start writing more jokes. Now earlier I said it's not genetic, it's not the hair loss, although that's, that is genetic. Um, it's, uh, that was not funny, cut it out. <laughs> that was a joke. Um, this can be taught, it can be learned, it can be practiced. If you think you're not funny, you are not like Commander Data in Star Trek, unable to tell a joke because you don't have a humor chip or an emotion chip or whatever. Hey, that, uh, that was just a plot device, obviously, for the writers, um, and a very hackneyed one at that. You can learn to be funny. And you learn to be funny by practicing and getting it wrong and practicing and getting it wrong. And as Brandon talked about the try-fail cycle, oh good, he is teaching. Um, that is a natural part of how you are going to learn this. You're going to try and you're going to fail. And that's why being a class clown was something that actually built a career skill for me because I was really bad at it and then I got better. So, lots and lots of refining until I have the last panel that I like. A last panel that I like. Scott Adams, who writes Dilbert, came up with this formula, and I know I'm missing an element here, and he said that a comic strip is funny if it hits on one of these. It, you know, if it's recognizable, if there's cruelty, if there's something cute, if something clever happens, uh, if something really bizarre happens. And it's funnier the more of those things he can fit in. And he said, you know, about the funniest I ever am is when Dogbert is offering career advice while, you know, wagging his tail and smiling. And you've got cruel and bizarre and uh, probably clever, not particularly recognizable. Um, Whereas Bill Watterson, who did Calvin and Hobbes, would knock it out of the park all the time as Calvin and Hobbes, who are cute, are saying things which are always clever and it's a child and a stuffed animal and it's always recognizable and yet it is so, it is so deep and so poignant that it ends up being, you know, it, it ends up twigging bizarre and yet we accept it. And if Hobbes is tackling Calvin, then there's cruel as well. And <laughs> Scott Adams' point was, uh, well, the point he was trying to make is include as much of this as possible. The point that I took home was I can't just do those five things and have it be funny. What I can, however, do is look at what's happening in my last panel and ask myself, why am I laughing? Or more often, why am I not laughing? What's missing? And I'll start to poke this a little bit. One of my favorite moments in science fiction, and it's one that's stuck with me for, I don't know how many years, lots and lots of years, um, since before I was your age, um, was a story or a, a point in the book Ringworld. Anybody, any of you read Ringworld by Larry Niven? Okay, one hand. You're awesome. <laughs> Everybody else has homework. <laughs> uh, Ringworld by Larry Niven. There were, uh, I, I, I now need to set up the joke. There is the puppeteer who is from a vegetarian race. They are paranoid. They're immensely powerful, but they are paranoid and have been manipulating human history and lots of history for a long time. There is the Kazin who is, uh, think bipedal tiger, only not like a furry, cat person in a convention, more like a ferocious tiger who walks on two legs and carries actual weapons and wants to eat you. Um, and the two of them are talking about humor in humans. And the Kazin, who they've been at war with the humans for a long time, the Kazin says, 
Our scientists think that the human sense of humor is an interrupted defense mechanism. And Nessus says, no sane creature would interrupt a defense mechanism. Okay, none of you laughed. I loved that moment because within the context of the story, the paranoid person is essentially saying, humans are all insane for being able to laugh. And, and Niven's point was that when we laugh, sometimes it's because we are making a choice at some non-choice-making level. We are making a choice to laugh instead of running screaming from the room. Have you ever had that moment? Have you ever laughed at a thing that's horrible? <laughs> because the only alternative was horror. Incidentally, horror, that's another genre where the writer is seeking to alter your metabolism with words. Good times. <laughs> um, let me talk about interrupted defense mechanism. Uh, i g give you an example. I was at Novell, you know, the buildings down, yeah, that, those are still Novell buildings, right? I haven't worked there in almost 10 years, which is awesome. <laughs> and it was September 11th of 2001, and we had all been watching horrible things on the news, you know, with airplanes crashing into buildings and buildings falling. And so we're all water coolering and getting no work done. And I was just wandering down the halls from office to office talking to people. And because I am an awful person, what I would often do is be talking to somebody like this who has now turned away from their window and is talking to me, and then I would say, ooh, low-flying plane. <laughs> that was me. That was me who did that. And about half the people I did that to shrieked and turned around and then laughed. Why? Because they had accumulated a whole morning's worth of horror, real, honest-to-goodness horror and fear, and now they were interrupting that defense mechanism and allowing themselves to laugh. The other half of those people are no longer my friends. Um, <laughs> now, as I was telling this story, some of you, raise your hands, were horrified at my behavior, right? And you just laughed at me talking about the fact that I lost friends over this. <laughs> that thing right there, you're all insane. <laughs> you're interrupting a defense mechanism. Um, any of you have ever heard uh, dead baby jokes? <laughs> oh yeah, these are awful. These are awful, okay? Um, and yet we laugh. Why do we laugh? Well, because the alternative is to actually imagine you know, a leaf blower and a wood chipper and snow and you are laughing because you pictured something that I didn't say. And that's a principle that I also don't know how to summarize in just a few words, which is the pie fight that you imagine is funnier than the pie fight I can draw. And that is the case, that is the situation we get when the beat is here, and it sets up something inevitable and maybe a little surprising. And then this panel is just time passing, and this panel is a reaction to what happened there. I'll give you an example from uh, Scott Kurtz. He did a uh, comic strip called PVP. Uh, it's been running for 16 years. Do um, you know what LARPers are? LARP. I'm so sorry. Um, we have LARPers, we have Star Wars LARPers who are in the park. And then we have Star Trek LARPers who show up in the same park. And then we have some redneck Civil War reenactors <laughs> who are really just LARPers who are also in the same park and they are all arguing and then we get to a strip in which they are arguing and in this panel, so this panel was set up where you see basically Spock and uh, Darth Vader 
and Johnny Reb yelling at each other. And in this panel, a guy walks in from off stage wearing a backward ball cap and he says, hey, uh, my truck just broke down, a refrigerator truck full of key lime pie. Can you guys give me some help? <laughs> nothing, nothing. And then this panel, which is a Klingon saying, it was a good day to pie. <laughs> the pie fight that you imagine with Johnny Reb and Darth Vader and Yoda and Spock and whoever else, the pie fight that you imagine far, far funnier than any pie fight Scott Kurtz could have fit into this panel. And he knew that. And so that's what he did. He gave you the opportunity to draw the pie fight. Uh, and then all he did was tell a bad joke, you know, throw a pun at the end. Um, so when I mentioned, you know, snowblower and wood chipper, and you put your hands over your mouths, and you were imagining a thing that I was not imagining. There's just words. I've been there, done that, not going to draw that mental picture again. Um, now, in terms of knocking you out of the story versus not knocking you out of the story, if you're not writing a humor story, if you're not writing a story in which funny things happen, in which there is slapstick. You can have moments like this. You, you can have hidden pie fights. That should be what I call this, hidden pie fight. I'm going to take a moment and write a note to myself. Hidden pie fight. You can have hidden pie fights that don't knock the reader out of the story because the reader knows exactly how much pie is allowed to be thrown before they will stop believing that this could happen in the universe that you've created. You know, you can have a couple of characters who don't get along, who, you know, fight over a certain thing, and then a third character comes in with a box full of that thing, and then we cut away to the hospital and we're all laughing. We didn't need to see the fight. We didn't even know, need to know how it happened, but we know that they got in a fight. And that's far funnier, honestly, than actually describing the, you know, broken bottles in the bar or whatever else. Bar fights are horrible, horrible things. So this principle, the hidden pie fight, can serve you really well if you're trying to put humor in what you're doing. And a question. So basically the noodle instant from Calvin and Hobbes is... <laughs> Where he keeps on mentioning the noodle incident, mm. which is something Calvin did, but you never see it. Okay, that's similar. I mean, that, that's a that's a running gag. Um, no, that's actually something completely different. That's uh, the I mean the, the hidden pie fight, as I'm describing it, is where you lead up to a thing happening, and then you skip ahead of it and make the reader imagine it happening. What you're talking about is, we j I, I would just call that the noodle incident principle, which is you continually refer to a thing that has happened and you let the reader inflate that story in their own minds. Um, because as, as you think about you know, what the noodle incident may have been, at this point it's always going to be funnier than what uh, Bill Watterson actually could have drawn. Any of you watched Sherlock? Yes. Okay. Any of you uh, disappointed with how he survived? You know he survived. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Sorry. Um, during the episode in which he talks about surviving, we never get a clear explanation. He talks about things that could have happened as if they were part of his plan. Um, and then we cut away and we realize, well, that's not what happened. We see other people talking about what could have happened. And it's, it's noodle incident humor for us. And the reason that Moffat did that is because the actual plan that Holmes had, whatever it was, had to be so contrived, so absolutely unlikely, that it would completely break any ability we had to suspend disbelief anymore. It just would have broken the show. And so they hung a lantern on it. The phrase hung a lantern. You guys with me? No, no. Two different things. Two different. I'm going to have to come back around on this. 
they hung a lantern on it and they said, yes, it is so ridiculous that you will never believe it and Holmes isn't going to tell you what it is and so we were allowed to, we were allowed to proceed. Okay, hang a lantern on something is when you call attention to it and say, essentially say, yeah, this, this is a real problem. This, this is serious. And then you move on and the reader says, oh, well, okay, as long as you, the writer, recognize that this thing that the characters are doing is dumb and the characters know that it's dumb, then I'm okay. But if they just forge on ahead, having gone into the basement with no flashlights, and somebody says, guys, this is really dumb. I can't see. This is what everybody does wrong. Yeah, but I know this basement, like the back of my hand, will be fine. Shut up. Okay? Um, we've hung a lantern on it. Lamp shading, on the other hand, is when you take this thing and you say, and it comes from the, uh, they didn't do it in Weekend at Bernie's, but I think of Weekend at Bernie's. It's when you've got a person standing in the room and you don't want anybody to know that they're there. You put a lampshade on their head and when everybody looks at them, they just see a lamp. Okay? So they are actually two completely different things, but they solve the same problem. There's a thing in your book that people won't believe. Hang a lantern on it, call attention to it, or lampshade it, hide it, disguise it as something else, make people look at other things. Um, hanging lanterns on things is often exactly where you are going to use these principles and make people laugh. Why? Because people who have lost control of their metabolisms are usually unable to think clearly enough to refute what you've put in your book. <laughs> True fact that I just made up. <laughs> okay, so the interrupted defense mechanism. Um, what are the things that you laugh at that you shouldn't? You catch yourself doing that? Laugh at things you shouldn't laugh at? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, dead baby jokes, garbage pail kids, loved those. Um, you laugh at anger? Okay, I'll be honest, I watch, I, I watch a very, very small, very small amount of TV because usually the TV that is trying to be funny will set up situations in which we are supposed to look at this situation and either be horrified that such a thing could actually exist, uh, usually in social settings, uh, or we laugh at it because of how absurd it is. And have you ever watched The Guild? Felicia Day's web series? The Guild opens with a member of the Guild who is hot for Felicia Day's character showing up at her door, having tracked her down using the internet, and then he's in her house and being all forward and stalkery and there is a part of me that looks at that and says okay I just need to drag that boy outside and have words with him and all of these words are going to end in syllables that sound a lot like a bone breaking <laughs> that's what this boy needs because his behavior is really really inappropriate and yet we are expected to just laugh at it um, why Interrupt a defense mechanism because, because that is a legitimate fear. And have you ever afraid that somebody you've talked to on the internet might find you in real life? None of you? <laughs> none of you have done any? Okay, one. None of you have done anything on the... You want to know how many people read my comic? <laughs> About 130,000. You want to know what the percentage is of human beings? out of the total population who are sociopaths <laughs> greater than one in 100,000. <laughs> That's all I need to know. Um, and so, so again, the, the interrupted defense mechanism for, for those first episodes, those first webisodes of uh, Felicia Day's The Guild, uh, absolutely the tool they were relying on. Um, What's a, what's a thing that you guys watch that is funny? I've just confessed to not watching much TV. Big Bang Theory, How I Met Your Mother, Psych, Community. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about three of those. Psych, uh, which I hate. Oh, gosh, because, hang on, because 
he is such an idiot. <laughs> he gets up there and starts blathering away, knowing nothing about what he's doing, and we're supposed to be laughing because of interrupted defense mechanism. But you know what? I speak publicly. And when I'm in front of a crowd and I don't know what I'm talking about, that's not, oh, I'm so embarrassed. That's, I have committed a crime in front of these people of which I need to repent. Your time is valuable. And so I watched Psych, and oh, it just makes me, I don't like those episodes. <laughs> so I stopped watching Psych. My kids love it. So, community and Big Bang Theory. Um, I've laughed at Big Bang Theory. I like it. I love community. And I realized that the difference for me between Big Bang Theory and community is that Big Bang Theory took nerdy stuff and hung a lantern on it and made us laugh at it. Now, yes, we, ha we have protagonists who are nerdy people, and we laugh at each of them in turn, but the majority of the time we are laughing at them. Whereas with community, the nerds are doing nerdy, geeky things, and that's not the joke. The joke is usually deep social commentary, and when we're laughing, we realize things like, you know, wow, Abed is a genius. I, I wish I could find, you guys, you guys remember the, the episode where Abed analyzes everybody at the table in terms of the relationships they would have if they were TV characters? <laughs> and he ends with, and that is why we, and I mean this in multiple ways, will never be friends, which is the name of a TV show. And as I watched that, I was floored because the writers had done a, they had done a deconstruction of a dozen different sitcom type relationship TV shows, told us in two words why those shows were broken, and then wrapped it all up by saying none of those relationships can ever work. A situation like Friends doesn't exist. And when Abed finished that sentence, he had established the crisis for the whole show. And we all laughed. And because we were laughing, that message got right in there to us. So I loved community. Eh, Big Bang Theory, I mean, I'll laugh at it, but, uh, but I don't love it as much. Now, having said that, what are the things that you guys love about these? I, okay, I've told you I hate psych. Why do you like it? You stupid people, you. <laughs> Because Sean's stupid. Okay. I mean, is it is it this? Does this does this peg it for you? Interrupt a defense mechanism? No. Why do you laugh at Psych? I think it's bizarre. He starts off with this really crazy idea and then figures out how that's actually the truth. Okay. So they set up something that is bizarre, and then when you get to the end of the episode, we've hit surprising yet inevitable. Okay. Any other? There's a lot of like really, really witty, clever one-liners that you see throughout it, like a lot of like a lot of comic gags. A lot of comic gags. Comic run, gags. Uh, run gags. Okay. Like okay. <laughs> Listen to you talking like humor scientists already. I feel awesome. <laughs> okay. When we when you listen to dialogue that is snappy, when you listen to snappy dialogue, there's a lot of things going on. One of them, one of them is the comic drop. Uh, one of my favorites, and I don't have a, there's not really a humor classification for this necessarily, is, I'm going to call it the mixed metaphor, but it's not really a mixed metaphor. It's just the metaphor that you weren't expecting that, that exaggerates what is happening, and it's related to, I don't know how to spell exaggeration. I'm going to sign that picture. Um, <laughs> my dad used to say, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, don't exaggerate. <laughs> my dad was not as funny as I am, <laughs> obviously. Um, the Mixed Metaphor, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Anybody read it? OK. Classic, classic humor piece. 
and one of the most memorable lines from it is the Vogon ships hum in the, hung in the air in much the same way that bricks don't. <laughs> okay. We have a description of a thing that really isn't a description of the thing. He's forcing you to paint the picture. And he has mixed the metaphor badly. He's describing exactly what this isn't and telling you that that's how you should understand that it is. There's a little bit of comic drop in there where as you read it, you realize that the narrator is an idiot. Why, why would this be described in this way? Um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a great example, great example of situational humor. Uh, it's not a great example of humor that won't knock you out of the story. The reason why is that he relied on bizarre all the time and made social commentary points and jokes, and but the, the story was just absurd. Um, Terry Pratchett, on the other hand, anybody read Terry Pratchett? Okay, when Terry Pratchett uses hum humor, it doesn't knock us out of the story, unless you're reading The Color of Magic, which was his first Discworld book, which after you've, have you read Color of Magic? I read Color of Magic first, and I remember thinking, oh, this is like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, only fantasy. This is cute. Much, much later, I picked up some of the later books, and they were deeper, and they were darker, and the funny was more insidious, and it didn't knock me out of the story, and I laughed even harder. And then I went back and read Color of Magic and realized, oh, wow, Terry Pratchett realized that Douglas Adams had already done this, so he was going to go do something different. And now, uh, most of us who try and write humorous things will hold up Terry Pratchett as the great example of being able to put humor into a thing without taking you out of the story. Um, some of it is snappy dialogue. Some of it is comic drop. Some of it is situational. You know, having death show up and always speak in all capital letters. Um, you know, those, those things are fun, but uh, yeah, Pratchett's, Pratchett's brilliant. Um, what have I left off? Okay, so I've talked a lot about these tools. Um, how many of you, how many of you have, have trouble when you're trying to put something funny in your book? Yeah, okay. Do you deliberately put funny things in your books, or is it just your books, your, your writing, your whatever, your... Or does it just happen? It just happens? You're not trying to be funny, but you wrote something funny, and so you keep it. All right. That's level one. <laughs> you remember the Avengers movie? Okay. Do you know what action movie fatigue is? Action movie fatigue is the point in the movie where everything's happening at once, and you, the viewer, realize oh, this fight's been going on a long time. And then the fight keeps going, okay? Avengers, I started feeling action movie fatigue at the point where Hulk slams a big wedge of space worm down, and then Thor pounds it into the ground, and I remember thinking at that moment, wow, this fight has been going, going on a long time. Fifteen seconds later is Hulk side punch, okay? <laughs> And, I mean, the whole audience exploded in laughter with, you know, entrails everywhere. And the snowblower and the um, callback. Um, I have so much laughter, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't hear anything. And as I was laughing, my inner humor scientist said that right there. That is how you use a joke. You use the joke when somebody is likely to be suffering from action movie fatigue, or they're bored with exposition, or holy crap, this navel gazing has been going on for a whole paragraph. Who do you think you are? Um, you know, they, they, some people go even longer than that. Uh, and then there's humor, which breaks that up and allows the reader to, allows the reader to proceed, uh, prevents the reader from being, you know, bored or whatever. Uh, I wrote a horror piece uh, a couple of years back, called Flight of the Rune Rite, 12,000 words that end 
almost on a hopeful note, and then all hopes are dashed in the very last surprising yet inevitable sentence. Very pleased with the way that worked out. And as I was writing that, I kept throwing humor in accidentally. I kept being funny. And I'd go back and I'd read it, and I, and I would read it the wrong way. I'd read and not ask myself, okay, is this where the hackles are rising? No, I was reading it saying, okay, is, is that funny? Is that too funny? Is that, you know what I was doing? I don't like scary stuff. I hate scary stuff. Why did I even write that stupid story? I was defusing my own tension. I was interrupting my own defense mechanism in order to stay sane and finish the story. And so once the story was done, all I had to do was go back and pull about half of those out, keeping a few in key places for pacing purposes, and the story worked just fine. So, yes, put the humor in. Let the humor flow into the story. Make sure to mark the things that you wrote that your beta readers or your alpha readers thought were funny. Make sure to keep those because, and I say, when I say keep, you might not get to keep it there, but what, that thing you did, you've got to remember how to do that again. You've got to keep that because the ability to alter somebody else's metabolism with nothing but ink on a page, that is like magic. And when it happens, you keep it and you find another place for it if it doesn't fit there. Uh, the jokes that I throw away in panel four, Okay, I don't actually save them. Um, usually I'm throwing them away because I know I've told that joke before, but every so often I will write a line of dialogue that is hilarious and absolutely doesn't fit, and I will take the whole script as is, the whole Word document, and drag it into a folder called off track. And off track means this piece of dialogue, this thing, is not canon, it's not part of the comic, but there's something in here that I needed to save because I loved it. Uh, and then I will every so often go into the off-track folder and find some gem that is exactly what I need. Um, we have about 15 minutes. Is that, what, is that clock right? If I push this button. Is that clock right? Wait, the clock was right not long ago. <laughs> No, 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 but this is not the dead clock that's right. Oh my gosh, the minute hand is moving <laughs> as I watch. And so, as you see, with a Bose Einsteinian condensate. That was an attempt at a science joke. Um, all right, so we got about 25 minutes left. Uh, can, do I open it up for Q&A? Does Brandon do Q&A? Okay, let's do Q&A. Ask me anything. Start with humor, but then if we run out of funny stuff, ask me anything else. Yes, sir? Well, with uh, balancing the tone, is there anything that's scary that when you write this, you keep pushing that you're going to write it? Anything that's keeping you from simply writing the same thing? Watch Disney's The Lone Ranger and never, ever do that. <laughs> okay? There is a scene where Tonto has just watched the, not the actual bodies, but they're representative of the bodies of his kin floating down the river, you know, feathers and axes and whatever else. A great slaughter has occurred upriver, and Tonto knows it has occurred, and this is a dark moment. It was actually pretty well executed, very artistic, and not 30 seconds later, the Lone Ranger's horse is up in a tree, and Johnny Depp is camping on the line saying, Something wrong with that horse. Which, you know, the line runs in the trailers, and you think, oh, hi, that's funny. When I was in the theater, lots and lots of people laughed, and I wanted to beat them about the head and neck with something sharp and killy. <laughs> because did you not see what the filmmakers just did to you? They took one of the greatest tragedies of American history of our history, which is the murder of the indigenous people here, and then before you had any time to savor it or think about it, they told a joke about the horse. It was almost criminal. So yes, it's possible to do it wrong. I, when I'm trying to balance, when something dark happens in the comic, um, 
Confession time. Schlock mercenary is what it is. Beat, 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 punch. I'm not going to run a strip that doesn't have a punchline. In order for me to do something terrible, something horrible to the crew members, I have, I have two choices. Well, I have plenty of choices. Uh, sometimes, sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not. One is to put the tombstone right here and tell a joke about the tragedy. Okay, go, go whole IDM, you know, just fully interrupt the defense mechanism, laugh at the fact that a character you love just died. That's not always the, the right answer. Um, sometimes it is to set up the fact that there is going to be a death and then put the death here and give the characters time to process it. And these are usually places where I will take the one cheat I allow myself and I will add panels and do a Sunday strip so we have some time to process and then I will put the joke down here and we get our punchline and we get our tragedy. Now, nine panels is not a whole lot of space between something awful happening and me making you laugh. The other thing that I'll, that I'll often do, because this form that I'm working within is really weird, uh, is I'll put the tombstone there. Uh, I won't actually talk about what has happened it's something that happens off panel and you know that it's happening and you are feeling dread for this having happened and what the characters are reacting here reacting to here in this panel is something completely different and so by the time we come back around to the discovery that there is a death uh, or whatever um, I've defused it a little bit none of these techniques are going to work for you in prose but now you see how I do it and maybe that's useful Another question? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that was um, there were two things that made that work. One, it's the Joker. If it had been anybody else, it wouldn't have worked for us. Uh, but it was Heath Ledger as the Joker being silly and campy. And the whole time the Joker's on screen, we know he's going to do horrible things. We've already seen him do horrible things. We are expecting bad things to happen. Um, but it's the Joker, and so we know that he wants us to laugh. Does that make sense? He's, I mean, th th he's a weird character in that regard, Joker, and yet he's the most, he's the most murderous, macabre of any of the Batman villains. And yes, when that happens, it is very bizarre and weird and shocking. And I think there's a little bit of an interruptive defense mechanism, and there is also surprising yet inevitable. We knew somebody was going to die, and when it happened with a pencil, it surprised us and we laughed. So... There's a, there's a lot to look at there. By the way, I love the fact that you brought that up because that's the sort of exercise all of you should be doing is deconstructing the things you watch and asking yourself, especially in things like The Dark Knight, why on earth did I laugh at that? Oh, what's wrong with me? Or, oh, that's awesome. I'm a horrible person and Joss Whedon knows it. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's down. <sighs> yeah. So, other questions? Anything? Yes, sir? Um, what methods do you use to ensure that what you think is funny is in fact going to be funny for other people? I have a tool that's not actually available to any of you, and I'm sorry to bring it up, but you can't have her. <laughs> I've been married now for 20 and a half years. I know my wife's face. And so I will write a script that has no pictures in it yet. And if some sort of explanation is, need, is needed, I may pencil something like, uh, you know, character, I may put a stick figure 
in one of the panels just so she can see it. But I will hand her a week of comics and then I will stand to the side and watch her read. And if her face doesn't do the things that her face needs to do, then I will snatch the scripts where it was, oh, there's something wrong with you. And then I will go fix what I got wrong. Okay? And if she laughs, if she's happy, then I know I've done it right. This is not a foolproof mechanism. I, the, many, many, many times, the strips that Sandra and I think are the absolute funniest get no commentary at all, while strips that just sort of, you know, they were, they were acceptable, you know, it's, it's, it, it clears my low bar. I'll put it in the strip because I need to draw something, um, are the ones that we'll just get piles and piles of email about. But that tool, um, okay, so Sandra's not available to you, but your beta readers are. You've got somebody who reads your stuff, uh, and this applies to anything else that you're trying to do in your book. Once you know what your beta readers are like, once you learn to read them, then, uh, then you can gauge how well you're doing from how they're reacting to what you've written. <sighs> yeah, it's sort of a meta game. A little bit of head game in there. Helps to be old. Sorry. Yes? What about sugar free heads? Do you understand what's funny and like what you, the joke you want to make? But how do you deliver that in the right way? Okay. Um, you've heard the, the difference between humor and real estate. Real estate, location, location, location. Humor, delivery, delivery, delivery. Um, Delivery is touted as you know, kind of this be-all, end-all by a lot, of, a lot of humor professionals. Fundamentally, what delivery is, is pointing up the pieces that need to be pointed up without undermining the pieces that need to not be undermined. For instance, if you're doing a surprising yet inevitable and you telegraph the surprise, you've screwed up the delivery. Give you an example from one of my favorite jokes. Uh, when I was a little kid. Uh, maybe stop me if you've heard this one. Why did the monkey fall out of the tree? Because it was dead. <laughs> Loved that joke. Loved that joke. My friend Todd, we're on the bus, and we're all laughing and laughing and laughing. Uh, we're actually waiting for the bus to go. They, nobody else has gotten on the bus yet. We're laughing, and the bus driver says, what is so funny? What are you boys laughing at? And Todd says, Funny joke. Well, tell me the joke. Okay, why did the dead monkey fall out of the tree? <laughs> now, I thought that was a great joke, but that was a great joke because what Todd had just done was comic drop. Um, my brother, I, my brother uh, Randy Taylor, uh, any of you on Twitter? Kids, no. T okay, well, see, and that's awesome. Uh, that's awesome. My brother Randy and I on Twitter, uh, we will joke with each other all the time. Usually, trying to deliver a punchline while setting the other guy up to deliver an even better punchline. Um, we don't do it all the time, but some of our exchanges are just huge fun, and some of our changes, our uh, our exchanges rely on a comedic trick that I call abandoned joke, okay? And abandoned joke is this without this. It's where you're halfway through telling a joke and then you admit that the setup to this joke can only be, you know, for instance, racist or sexist or whatever else. And instead of actually saying anything racist or sexist or awful, you just abandon joke and say, and you know what, I'm just not going to finish. Only you deliver that in a way that's a little funnier. Um, and I, I now can't think of any examples. By the way, uh, um, mugging leprechauns is perfectly legal. Um, one, true fact. Two, it's a book that my brother wrote that is full of it's a little like 99 cent ebook that is full of funny little things he said on Twitter. And it is great, 
for reading and then asking yourself, why did I laugh at that? Or more importantly, why didn't I laugh at that? Um, one of the jokes that he told recently was, wow, Putin invaded a neighboring country after hosting the Olympics way faster than Hitler did. <laughs> and then his hashtag was, hope it's still funny soon. <laughs> okay, that brilliant, biting, 140 character social commentary that says, oh my gosh, that totally is what Germany did. Oh wow, that totally is what Putin did. I sure hope we don't end up going to war <laughs> with Russia. I, yeah, great stuff. So delivery. I remember, a, um, I remember a comedian who was really good at what we call the cognitive humor, which is where you deliver a punchline and people don't realize it's a punchline until you know, three or four seconds later. He told a joke. I wish I could remember his routine because then this would be much funnier. Um, he told a joke and the audience was silent. And as the audience is silent, he did this. It's a joke grenade. And then they started to laugh as they got it. Okay? <laughs> Not that he had, but he told people, you know, it's a joke grenade. Wait, wait, a, wait a few seconds and it's going to go off. And then it went off and because he had called attention to the fact that you hadn't gotten the punchline yet, everybody thought it was funnier. Much, much later in the routine, like right at the end of the routine, he tells a joke and as he's telling the joke, he mimes pulling out the grenade, delivers the punchline and chucks the grenade and does this. <laughs> and there is a second of silence and then everybody gets it at once and the audience erupts in laughter, okay? That is delivery. That is, that is not a thing that I can aspire to on this page because it's just impossible. But it's a thing that I watch very, very closely. Uh, Jim Gaffigan, any of you ever watched Jim Gaffigan? Um, Jim Gaffigan uses the little uh, inside comic voice to comment on the other things that he said. You know, as he's talking about, uh, uh, I guess he's talking about cake, and then the little voice says, Wow, he really doesn't like cake. I'm not sure this is funny anymore. <laughs> Sometimes that's a voice of a person in the audience. Sometimes that's his conscience. Sometimes I don't know what the little voice is. Uh, point of view error. <laughs> okay, some of you got that. Has Brandon covered POV errors yet? Okay. So it just wasn't a very good joke. <laughs> anyway, I was watching an, an episode, an episode, I was watching uh, Mr. Universe. And there's a point in Mr. Universe where he tells a religion joke and, and then uses the little voice and then does the next beat in the joke and then pauses weirdly. And I watched that. I was trying to understand his delivery. I was trying to understand his timing, trying to figure out what he got wrong. And after the third viewing, I figured it out. Well, first of all, his routines are rehearsed. You know, it's not improv. Jim Gaffigan, brilliantly, brilliantly scripted, does a great job with this. That routine, he broke out the little head voice one beat too early because the audience wasn't reacting the way he expected them to. And so he needed to, he, he wanted to pump up the crowd. And then he got to the point where he really needed it and it wasn't there for him because he'd already used it. I got to watch Jim Gaffigan make a mistake in his own routine. Now, it didn't make it any less funny for me. I still loved it. But in watching, in watching his routine, I suddenly got a window into how carefully scripted everything is that comes out of his mouth so that he's delivering these things exactly when we need them. More questions? I, I, I could just talk about delivery forever and never get anywhere, so. What is one of your favorite moments in Squawk Mercenaries? Um, I have, I have, uh, going full time, realizing I could pay the bills, <laughs> and uh, paying off the car. As a business, folks. 
<laughs> you want my favorite moments? Those are them. Uh, the jokes I think I've the the jokes I think I've done the best with. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I'll go back and I'll read the archives and I'll I'll read a joke, and think, wow, that's a that's a pretty intelligent joke to have made eight years ago. <laughs> who, <laughs> who let Smart Howard in that early? <laughs> I thought I only got smart now. Um, my kids, this is weird, having my 10-year-old not go to bed on time because he's reading things that I wrote eight years ago. <laughs> and laughing. I like the maxims. I really like the maxims, and I'm particularly pleased with some of them. Uh, the formula for the maxims, it's the 70 maxims of maximally effective mercenaries, uh, and they are little nuggets of wisdom that are just awful. Maxim number one, pillage, then burn, uh, which <laughs> has been used before. Absolutely not original to me. Uh, maxim two, a sergeant in motion outranks a lieutenant who doesn't know what's going on. I've got military people who email me regularly and say, oh my gosh, that is so succinct and so brilliant and so true. How did you do that? Where did you serve? I'm like, well, um, <laughs> is it not obvious <laughs> that the person who knows what they're doing but has no rank outranks the person who doesn't know what they're doing and is just sort of standing still? I mean, that, and when I said it, uh, it rang true to me, and so I ran with it, and, and people liked it. Um, I had some uh, Navy brats come up to me. It's okay. That's what my friends in the Navy call the kids this age. Your age, actually. Sorry. Um, <laughs> come up to me and say, we've got a great maxim for you. Everything is amphibious if you can fit it into an LC-5. <laughs> I was at a convention, so I was behind a table a lot like this, so I said, okay, I, I, I get it. It's funny, but uh, sort of funny. What's an LC-5? <laughs> I said, so, landing craft five. It's the boat that you put things in, and then you unload them onto the beach. I said, See that? My readers don't all know what an LC-5 is, so that's not going to work. But I can fix this. Hang on a moment. And I, I felt like, you know... Now I don't know. The, the name of the psychic magicians who just sort of do a thing Mentalist. that's amazing. Mentalist, yeah, one of those dudes. I, because I'm like, no, don't, don't tell me, don't tell me. Anything is amphibious if you can get it back out of the water. <laughs> and these guys busted up laughing like, oh my gosh, that is so funny and so wrong. And how did you do that? <laughs> years and years of practice. And the technique is actually subversion. I took something that they were already familiar with and I subverted it by giving it a new ending. One of my favorite examples of subversion, that's how we got onto this topic, all him, uh, my favorite stuff of Schlock Mercenary, uh, is Maxim 12, um, a soft answer turneth away wrath. Once wrath is looking the other way, shoot it in the head. <laughs> oh my gosh, you took this gentle, wondrous verse from the Bible and you made it about murder. <laughs> How could you do that? <laughs> Did that because I wanted to go full time. <laughs> um, so the maxims are a lot of fun. Writing those, I, I do a calendar every year that's got 12 maxims in 12 months. Um, I say every year. I've done three of them now. There are 70 maxims, so I don't get to do a full three more. I, I get to do at least two, though. Um, I have not written all 70. Um, and last year, I needed to come up with seven. Anything is uh, amphibious, if you can get it back out of the water, was one of them. I looked at what needed to be written, and I looked, after, the, after it was done, uh, at how many actual words there were. About 120 actual words. That took me nine and a half months to write. Why? Well, because what I'm trying to write when I'm doing those maxims needs to read like a scripture. It needs to read like something that people have been saying as a nugget of wisdom over and over and over again. It needs to feel like a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, or a soft answer turneth away wrath, 
or just a dab will do ya or whatever. Did somebody say McDonald's? No. No. It doesn't need to sound like that. But <laughs> in order to pull that off, I write and rewrite and rewrite and then set it aside. Uh, people send me Maxim suggestions all the time and usually I look at them and realize, oh, you are trying to tell a joke with a Maxim. What I want to do with the Maxims is get people to tell their own joke by creating a piece of wisdom that, one, you're horrified that it's a piece of wisdom, and two, it conjures up images and, and it subverts something. And Nine months for 120 words. So those are some of my, those are some of my favorites. By the way, this is one of the reasons why they tell you n never write your own chapter epigraphs, ever. You know, the little things in the front of a chapter. Because those usually need to sound like scripture. And you can spend as much time writing 40 words at the beginning of that chapter as you can spend writing the whole chapter. Uh, of course, you know, Brandon does it anyway, and he actually tells a story with them because he's a jerk who gets to break the rules. <laughs> When you are ready to spend a whole month writing 40 words, you will know that you have arrived. <laughs> Next question. I think I've got about a minute. Minute and 32 seconds. Yes, sir. Writing process. Like, when you put in your deadline, do you just, like, imagine that process and you're just like, oh, I get too many words done, like, this day and this day, and I'm done by Thursday, I'm supposed to wake up Friday? Or is it just like, if Thursday night I have to write? Oh, no, I work, I work a month ahead. Okay. I work a month ahead. I need to finish a week of comics during a calendar week. My favorite weeks are the week where Monday was spent writing strips, Tuesday was spent penciling strips, Wednesday was, Wednesday was spent inking, and then Thursday, Friday, and Saturday I did it all over again and got two weeks done in one week. Um, for a long time the process has been broken because I've had insomnia and I would wake up in the morning and not be able to write and it just screwed things up. But this week I got the process that I wanted and Tuesday morning I had a Sunday strip already written and penciled waiting for me to put art on and I sat down and wrote six dailies and then I went to the drawing table at Dragon's Keep and penciled and inked them and so I started the day feeling like I had nothing and at the end of the day I had a whole week and that was cool because today I needed to put the capstone on 10,000 words that's under NDA for a client and I can't tell you any more about it but hey words for money and I needed to finish that today, and then I needed to come teach this. And that completely ate up today, so I didn't get to do any inking. So my process is really all about finding the holes in which I am allowed to be a creative, and then being creative. Also, sometimes there's Smart Howard, Dumb Howard. Um, that's my timer. Uh, Smart Howard is the guy who writes, and who pencils, who composes pictures, uh, Dumb Howard is the guy who's only good for inking, which is basically like tracing. Um, and, and yes, I will time my days so that if there's work that has to be done and the only person available to do it is Dumb Howard, then what I have queued up is inking. Because if what I've queued up is writing, we're just wasting our time and I should go watch a movie instead. So, thank you very much for your time. Do you need to send them off on?